Bienvenue au Théâtre national de la presse. Mon nom est Daniel Thibault. I'll be your moderator today. Ce matin, nous sommes en compagnie de la porte-parole libérale en matière d'affaires autochtones et de développement du Nord, la Dr Caroline Bennett, la porte-parole en matière de santé, le Dr Eddie Fry, euh, du Parti libéral, évidemment, accompagné du grand chef Harvey Wesno et du grand chef Alvin Fiddler. On va discuter de la question euh, des versions génériques de l'Occident. Take it away. Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for coming. Um, the drug, as you know, the drug OxyContin um, came off patent last month, which means that it can now be introduced by generic pharmaceutical companies as a generic drug. Earlier this year, OxyContin manufacturer Purdue Pharma replaced OxyContin with a new formulation that is supposed to be more difficult to crush and that turns to a gel when added to water for IV use and less likely, therefore, to be abused. But uh, as you well know, when you have a a drug that is used by street people for addictions, they can find extraordinary ways to make it usable. And we now know that on the web there are all kinds of ways in which you can use the new um, OxyNeo to be able to abuse it uh, on the streets. So the Canadian and Ontario medical associations wrote to Minister Aglukak on October the 26th, stating that, quote, and I quote, drugs with a high potential for abuse, such as oxycodone, should have abuse deterrent features, such as tamper-resistant formulas. And by that, I don't mean you can't open the bottle. I mean tamper-resistant in that you cannot use it for IV purposes or snort it or any of those kinds of things. The Minister of Health in Ontario, and eventually all, and I stress, all of the provincial and territorial health ministers asked the federal health minister to ban or at least delay the approval of generic versions of OxyContin until further research is done on the drug. Unbelievably, the Federal Minister of Health ignored the Council and advice of health ministers, Aboriginal leaders, police, doctors, pharmacists, addiction experts, and, uh, and, and leaders, and approved, approved generic OxyContin for production. Further, within six hours of the patent expiring, she gave six drug companies approval to develop and market a generic version of the old form of OxyContin. Now, this is a minister who, whenever she speaks about any health-related issue, continually parrots that she is, quote-unquote, working with the provinces and territories, and that the health and safety of Canadians is her highest priority. Yet this decision flies in the face of the unanimous request of the provincial and territorial health ministers, Aboriginal leaders, and advice from the College of Family Phys Physicians of Ontario, and Dr. Francine Lemire from the college is here in case you need to ask any questions of her later. Um, the Ontario Association of Police Chiefs and Aboriginal leaders across the country. So she, Ms. Aglukak, is not working is therefore not working with the provinces and territories. She's working against them and, and has decided to jeopardize the health of Canadians at risk and the security of communities at risk instead of making that her highest priority. So we now have six drug companies competing to ship truckloads of cheap, generic OxyContin onto our streets and into vulnerable communities. A recent study found that the annual social costs from OxyContin abuse could be as high as 504 million nationwide a year. The addition of, oxycod of oxycodone controlled release tablets to the Ontario drug formulary when that first happened was associated with a five-fold increase in oxycodone-related mortality and a 51% increase in overall opioid related mortality. Our concern is that the abuse of OxyContin and similar prescription drugs has precipitated a public health emergency, and particularly in Aboriginal communities. In 2009, the Nishnabi Aski Nation, NAN, declared a state of emergency across all of its 49 communities due, due to the overwhelming problem of addiction to prescription drugs like OxyContin. 
Earlier this year, the Cat Lake First Nation declared its own state of emergency for exactly the same reason. I'm really pleased that uh, Grand Chief Harvey Yesno and Deputy Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler are joining us this morning to, to paint the picture of the, of the problem up, up there. Thank you. <clears throat> well, this is um, a matter of life and death. Um, today we implore uh, Minister Agluk uh, and the Government of Canada to reverse the decision of the production of the ne generic oxycotton, and uh, and if the minister doesn't does not have the power, as she has stated uh, several times, I say get it. They got a majority government. This is also personal for me, as I've lost uh, family members. The Snobieski Nation, uh, with 49 communities, 32 of our communities are remote fly-in only. And communities are devastated by the uh, oxycotton it already has um, in a lot of communities in that. And so, um, so this is a, a battle, a significant battle, uh, the lives of the communities, and uh, and it impacts a lot of things. Not just uh, personally the uh, impacts of the addiction, but it's going to impact uh, a lot more uh, areas in resource development and. Um, things like that, there's a, it's going to have an impact on um, uh, what happens in the north. And, and, um, but we have not sat, sat idly by. Our communities have, uh, are beginning to find ways to pool resources, um, to begin to address the, uh, the, the problem of addictions in the community and that. And we have... Um, Asked the federal government uh, time and time again, including the minister herself, to visit our communities, and uh, that has never happened. As I understand, uh, I think uh, the minister, since she's been health minister, has only visited one First Nation community in the whole country. And um, so we're disappointed. Uh, we've asked for support and services, and, and, um, and that has not happened. And uh, we have, uh, as I've said, we've provided... Uh, on our own efforts with First Nations, uh, the detoxification, detoxification and treatment of individuals and that, there's some lot of successes. Unfortunately, we don't hear a lot, of, a lot about that. But just so as we were having some wins in the community, uh, uh, this government has now uh, made a decision to um, license uh, companies to produce the generic uh, oxycotton. Uh, so this is not... Uh, very good, uh, not only for our communities, I think many other communities as well, uh, not just First Nation. We think this is, uh, is a wrong decision. Uh, it's going to be a massive blow, I believe, but particularly the uh, remote communities uh, uh, in, in our area. Uh, but we remain hopeful uh, in imploring the, the government and minister to reverse the decision because uh, this is a matter of life and death. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> since we uh, got elected to the uh, nine executive at the end of August, uh, the Grand Chief and I, and there's uh, four of us on the nine executive, uh, I can say that uh, not a day goes by that we get a call from one of our communities, from one of our chiefs, from one of our uh, frontline workers, uh, telling us about an incident related to uh, uh, related to this epidemic, and. Uh, it is a, a high priority for us uh, to uh, get it addressed. And uh, as the Grand Chief uh, mentioned, uh, for many of our communities, it is a life and death situation. Just uh, to give you an example on the, uh, on the extent of the, the damage and the, and the devastation that this is causing, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were at one of our communities uh, in uh, Nishkandaga, uh, Lansdowne First Nation, uh, for their annual uh, conference on the prescription drug abuse epidemic and we were informed there at that conference uh, that some of their communities uh, in terms of the uh, the adults or the members abusing uh, uh, painkillers uh, abusing oxycontin uh, is as high as 70 to 80 percent of the of the community so it uh, it impacts uh, all of us uh, in the communities and uh, one of the frustrating things about this uh, and trying to address this issue is the fact that uh, since NAN declared 
uh, state of emergency in 2009 that the minister has not even, uh, or the government has not even acknowledged uh, any of our letters uh, from the chiefs, from the non-executive. And I think for, him, for her to, to demonstrate that, that, uh, that she cares about, <laughs> about our communities, that she should at least acknowledge the letters and to, to, to meet with the leadership and to visit uh, our communities. I think she needs to see firsthand uh, the damage uh, and the devastation that uh, uh, that's there uh, and, and caused by, uh, by uh, the prescription drug abuse epidemic. So we're asking her to, uh, uh, to meet with us on a priority basis and to come up and see firsthand uh, uh, the conditions in our communities. Uh, well, I want to thank the Chiefs for coming and sharing that that 70 percent is a huge percentage of morbidity and mortality in any community, anywhere, uh, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. And I think, I think what, what we need to, to stress here is that the provincial and territorial ministers who are responsible for the health of their populations have taken a strong position. The only person missing now who they've asked to help them with this is the Minister of Health who has certain powers. And the point is that the Minister of Health is also responsible for the health of First Nations. And she has abdicated that role completely. Now, we as Liberals have asked the Minister to do something that she does have the power to do. And that is to stop generic OxyContin from entering the market. Now, how can she do this? Before a drug which is produced enters the market, it has to get something called a drug identification number, a DIN. Well, the minister has, within her powers, under the, under the, um, the, 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 the Food and Drug Act, not to issue a DIN or to delay issuing a DIN. That's all we're asking her to do, delay the issuance of a DIN. But she has hidden behind this claim that she has no powers to ban the generic version. While this is not cut and dry, as she says, she does have the power to change the regulations of the Food and Drug Act not to issue a DIN. And this must be given before any drug reaches a marketplace, as I say. The fact that she's not used this authority makes it absolutely clear that either the minister does not understand the seriousness of the issue or she lacks the political will to do anything about it. Now, we're also saying that as she has created this delay, she should also use that time to call a meeting of health, Aboriginal governments, provincial and national public health officers, physicians, pharmacists associations, and the regulatory bodies that govern physicians and pharmacists to develop what the College of Family Physicians is asking for, which is a comprehensive, long-term plan to deal with the problem of OxyContin abuse and to look at the whole issue of the use of opioids because obviously people do need opioids to treat pain. So the, this is an issue that it's time something was done about it and the minister could do that and come together and create a plan. It takes leadership. I think the minister has shown an absolute lack of leadership. Carolyn? Thanks, Hetty, and, and thank you, particularly the chiefs, uh, for being here. Um, and thank you for, for Tanan for making sure that, that a number of us were able to go and visit the communities. Uh, I thought I'd seen a lot, but I, the stories themselves, I think, are, uh, are, uh, would be upsetting to any Canadian. Um, there in Cat Lake, when we met with Samuel Wesley for him to, to tell us his poignant story of, of trying, trying desperately to get off this drug and what it had done to his family. He'd lost his children, he'd lost everything. But when you opened the door to his home, there was no furniture in it, in that everything in the house had been sold to be able to buy OxyContin. Um, the deputy chief told us the story that, that she knows when the drugs come into the community because the, somebody knocks on her door at two in the morning trying to sell something from their household. This is a catastrophe in terms of, and tragic, in terms of communities with 70, 80 percent addicted from 11-year-olds to the, to the elders. This is, this is something the minister has got to see and deal with herself. But seeing that she's stubbornly refused the expert 
and community advice on approving the generic OxyContin, we've asked her both in the House and in writing to ensure that at least that the generic form of this highly addictive drug be, keep, be kept off off the, the First Nations Inuit Health Branch um, drug l b benefit list. That means that throughout government, there are formularies as to what government will pay for, um, for First Nations Inuit Health for, in corrections in the military. It's perfectly possible for this minister to let people know So the government of Canada will not pay for one pill of generic OxyContin because it won't be on their formulary in the same way that Dead Matthews has done with the Ontario drug benefit list. Elle doit faire savoir aux six entreprises que le gouvernement du Canada ne paiera pas le moindre comprimé générique d'OxyContin. Back in February, we called on the government to immediately commit the resources necessary to provide emergency services for those suffering from OxyContin withdrawal and work in partnership with First Nations on a comprehensive approach to improve mental wellness. We saw at Cat Lake that once that there was a Suboxone program in place that there was started to be hope. We were, we were disheartened in other communities that the First Nation, that the, the Health Canada nurses were forbidden um, to help Chief and Council develop a community plan and you can't have a Suboxone program without a community plan in place because the, 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 that pill alone can't help. So, bien loin d'arranger les choses, ces décisions vont en réalité empirer la situation. And so uh, I just ask for the, for the, uh, the, the chiefs to, to uh, finish uh, the presentation in terms of what you really want um, from the government. Thank you. Um, obviously, the, just to repeat, uh, uh, we believe the, um, number one is to, to reverse the decision in uh, licensing the, um, the uh, generic OxyContin. Uh, the other thing is that um, uh, we need resources uh, because a lot of these communities are, um, are remote. Uh, proper protocols are not in place. Uh, nurses not, are not allowed to uh, even participate in developing um, a plan of action by a community. Those instructions are coming from Health Canada not to allow the participation of the nurses. So there are some things there that are... Uh, uh, just grossly unfair uh, that, um, you know, uh, we're trying to address and cooperate uh, with officials, uh, but uh, somebody higher up uh, will trump that, you know. So we're asking for the resources to be able to address, uh, and I believe we, we can do it with uh, various partners, uh, including the province and, uh, and Health Canada and the community. Because um, we have committed our own on our own resources, many communities have done that. So, yeah. yeah last week uh, we met with the uh, the provincial health minister uh, Deb Matthews, and the the message that we uh, delivered at that meeting was that uh, there is a need for uh, a coming together uh, with with ourselves, with the province, uh, and with the federal government to uh, uh, develop uh, to look at developing a, a more uh, comprehensive strategy uh, in addressing this uh, this issue um, and I think we can start uh, by treating the addiction itself uh, with uh, using uh, suboxone we uh, our communities uh, from the feedback that uh, we've been getting from the communities that are using suboxone as a treatment uh, uh, are positive that it is effective and that we're asking Health Canada to, uh, to make it uh, readily available to our communities and to give uh, the communities the resources to be able to administer and to be able to deliver uh, uh, that drug as part of the treatment uh, program for, for our communities. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and again, I think you know, a good first step for this minister is to meet with us, to meet with the communities. I think that would be a good first start. And then to also, once we, once we begin to address the, the addiction itself, I think you know, there, there's a reason why uh, people, so many people, are abusing these painkillers, especially oxys. There, there's so many 
underlying issues in our communities that uh, that need to be addressed. So I think part of this comprehensive strategy uh, that we're calling for is to begin to look at those issues as well and, and get them addressed. So we're hoping that uh, that the minister will will hear uh, the call of, of our communities and, and meant to answer it. I want to thank uh, the, the the chiefs, and I, again, I want we're now open to questions, and I wanted to also remind you that Dr. Francine Lemaire is uh, is here from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Uh, if you wished to direct a question to her. Merci beaucoup. Nous allons procéder comme d'habitude. One question, one follow-up. Please uh, do let me know if you want to ask a question. We'll start with Susan Lang from CBC Radio. I'd like to ask, uh, to start with Grand Chief Harvey Yesno. Um, a couple of weeks ago, when the federal health minister um, talked about sort of new restrictions uh, for the, you know, before the decision on generic OxyContin, but put in new restrictions on, on that drug. Uh, she talked about a number of areas of how her government has taken steps to deal with prescription drug abuse on First Nations reserves. And in particular, she talked about like millions of dollars that the government is spending across the country, including $1.1 million in Northern Ontario, including I think a lot of it, it says, at least according to the website in your community. So I'm just wondering, when you talk about the need for resources, what that money is being used for, is it, and is it being put in the wrong place or not being spent in the right ways, I'm, I'm just, I'd like some clarity from your perspective on that. Well, usually any time there's an announcement for new resources and that, uh, there's a whole apparatus that has to be supported. And uh, our position uh, all along uh, is it doesn't trickle down to the where the need is, to our nursing stations. I, I mentioned the, um, uh, the protocols uh, uh, is one of the things that Health Canada said that preventing nurses from actually administering uh, suboxone as a, as a treatment. You know, they, they talk about lack of human resources uh, and proper protocols in place in that. So we don't see that happen, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, the trickling down to, to, to the communities, you know. And as I've said, you know, uh, there's 32 remote, uh, remote communities where you have to fly in. Uh, so uh, we've got extra challenges. Not all nursing stations are at the same level uh, as far as uh, the service. They're not fully staffed. There's a big challenge there. Uh, as well. So. I think that also, uh, I think there are four beds at the Sioux Lookout uh, Zone Hospital in, uh, for addiction, um, but it's 30 days and then they go back to their community without a program. Uh, so it's again, uh, I think doc Dr. Claudette Chase at the Sioux Lookout uh, Zone Hospital was pretty frustrated that without the capacity in the communities, as the chiefs have said, it's very hard to, to see success. No, I was going to add uh, that uh, I think it's important to note that uh, in Ontario there are 134 per station communities and that then represents 40, 48, 49. And uh, the issue of, uh, of abuse is also occurring in other parts of the province. So if, if you look at that $1.1 million, distribute that right across uh, the region, um, and then you know, like in, depending on the, the size of, of, of the community, then you know, it doesn't really add too much, uh, you know, providing that all of that 1.1 million is actually flow to the communities, which we don't know. As the Grand Chief mentioned, uh, you know, any time there's a big announcement, there's a, there's a hold back, you know, to, for the government to administer whatever funding they're announcing. And uh, that's why we're calling for a meeting to really develop a, a more comprehensive strategy that will actually work, work for us. I just wanted to add one thing quickly, that a million dollars spent on this issue, or $1.1 million spent on this issue, that cost last year $504 million in terms of economic and social and health costs across this nation, it's a drop in the bucket. It really isn't addressing the issue. It's simply something that says, I don't have the political will, I don't particularly care, but I'm going to say I'm doing something. And this is the kind of thing that we really want to bring to the fore, that there isn't really a political will to protect Canadians, to help Canadians who are suffering this, 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 the problem of addiction. And the costs are high, the cost-benefit analysis of what it needs to do something about it is clear. There is no argument. It's very clear. It struck me um, in, doing this, in, in, in doing my lead-up stories to this that there is a, a, a certainly part of the medical community that made the you know, argument that people in chronic pain need this type of OxyContin, that there is that need out there for some people, that it is a legitimate drug. 
Is not part of the issue uh, doctors and prescribing and how it actually gets into these communities w as well? And, and is there more that can be done in those areas, particularly in those remote northern communities, that uh, there's a role there for, for the federal government to play in that? Or? There, uh, if I may start, there is a role for the federal government to play. Obviously, opioids have long been used in opiates for treating pain. It's the best pain treatment that you can find. So there's a valid use for it because there are many people who need it for acute and chronic pain. I mean, opioids are used postoperatively, for instance. Uh, so there is a valid use. But what we have found is that, in fact, with every valid use, there is the abuse or the misuse of it in communities. And it's, I mean, I don't know, OxyContin is being sold on the street now for, for 50 bucks a tablet or a pill. It's, we're talking about a lot of money being made here on the underground market on this kind of thing taking advantage of people and leading to abuse. Now, there are ways of dealing with opiate abuse, and this government has not done anything about it. The problem, and the reason we're asking for a comprehensive plan, and the people we've asked to come around the table are not only pharmacists who will actually fill out the prescriptions, are not only physicians who write the prescriptions, but they are the regulatory bodies, the College of Pharmacy, the College of Physicians, that have the ability to develop a plan in which they can find out where the abuse is, is going, which physician is, is prescribing massive amounts of this, of this drug, which physician has a lot of patients coming to them, multi-doctoring. They can find out the patients who actually are traveling around seeing five or six different doctors in a day to get the stuff and then sell it on the street. It's easy to do that, and I want to give you an example of a best practice that's been going on in British Columbia when I was practicing medicine, and that's about 25 years ago um, before I came into this place, where we had a triplicate prescription. You, the, any physician who was writing an opioid or an opiate had to write this on a triplicate prescription. One copy stayed with the physician, one copy went to the College of Pharmacists, and one copy went to the College of Physicians. And by looking at those copies, you were able to flag across the province of British Columbia which doctor had an unusually large number of people that they were giving these drugs to, who were the names, what were the names of the people who were actually going from doctor to doctor, and it was posted every day in doctors' offices and in pharmacies so that they have no reason to say, I did not know that person A was my, I was the fifth person they came to for drugs because it was known. And there was an ability, therefore, to find the persons who were not prescribing appropriately, who were over-prescribing, who were helping to get this out on the street. So there is a way to do something about it. We're hoping that the federal government should take that leadership role, not only for First Nations, and but for the, for the, um, for, for the armed forces who have huge amounts of a problem with this and the minister is directly responsible for them so if she says she doesn't have anything to do everything is a provincial jurisdiction she actually has a lot to do with the armed forces and with the first nations and inuit but she also has a leadership role to play as a minister of health who looks at drug um, compliances, who looks at abuse of drugs, who has that ability to give out drugs and to, and to say drugs can be marketed. She has a power, and she is not even caring to use it. And it's really frustrating, I know for Carolyn and I, that we felt that we had to have this press conference because this is such an issue that destroys so many people's lives. And there is so much that can be done uh, and that hasn't been done. And we've talked about Suboxone. In the United States, because this is a huge problem in the United States, they have 1.8 million people addicted to opioids, prescribed drugs. And they have just okayed a new drug called now Trexone, that's Vivitrol, which has success where people who are resistant to Suboxone and Methadone are finding that this might work for them. So these are all substitutions that can help people who are addicted to get off the addiction. We've done nothing like that. We're not even looking at the issues here. One of the concerns we've heard from chiefs and council across the country also is that communities still under the Indian Act um, have no ability to get rid of a doctor who is the scriptwriter, um, you know, Dr. Nick, uh, and, and that again, when to move away from the Indian Act and allow communities to hire their own nurses, hire the people that, 
the, and and the, the doctors that that, they, that are culturally sensitive and understand the impact of of uh, this, these kinds of prescriptions in a community is uh, is I think really important in terms of communities having the autonomy um, to look after their own their own health departments and and fix these problems as opposed to this top down rule setting where when they actually are asking the minister for help that that she she refuses. It's the only point I'd like to make there is uh, we don't have any pharmacies in uh, any of the remote communities. So uh, uh, the pharmacies in, situated in Sulacote and Timmins and Thunder Bay and places like that are, uh, are the ones that are prescribing, managing that. So I'm glad to hear that uh, if the governments do strengthen their um, regulations or laws to, uh, uh, as far as tracking and that, I think that would be helpful. Um, the other thing is... Um, um, on the enforcement side, uh, uh, let me just say uh, there's a uh, you know fairly good effort, uh, I believe, that's happening cooperation amongst the police forces, uh, the RCMP, uh, the OPP, and our own police force. I think uh, a lot has been done there, but that's just one piece of the uh, 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 the whole the whole situation. You know, I mean, uh, I think the government has said. Uh, you know, uh, we're not responsible for the abuse. You know, that's a different authority. Uh, well, you know, uh, that may, you know, it, it, it is true, you know, but I think, uh, I just wanted to say that the uh, uh, work is being done, but uh, here again is uh, another situation where we're uh, severely um, under-resourced as far as manpower and that because of our remoteness and that. But uh, at the same time, I want to say that the, uh, the police forces are cooperating. Uh, I mentioned the three, but there's also city city police forces that uh, that are helping as well. So, but that's just one piece. So the uh, uh, there's the whole law on that, and the whole judicial, you know, the courts as well. That uh, uh, people are getting slapped at the wrist, you know, and, uh, and really, um, you're not getting you're not getting the people that are really supplying this stuff, you know. Christy Kirkup, Sun Media. Uh, well, my question is for the Deputy Grand Chief. You talked about the fact that um, there isn't a day that goes by that you're not uh, dealing with this issue in your community. And uh, you, you talked about the, the rate of uh, abuse in the community. Um, in terms of uh, your role, uh, do, you, do you feel helpless? Or how do, how do you kind of grapple with the fact that you're, you, you have so many people in your community that are obviously mm -hmm. suffering and and you know, do you, do you feel a sense of helplessness? Um, I don't think we feel uh, helpless or, or hopeless. I think what gives us encouragement is uh, uh, the fact that our communities are, are doing something about it. You know, that they are working to address uh, uh, you know their issues. And uh, all we're saying here is that the government needs to also do their part uh, to support those communities. For example, uh, this Friday we'll be in a community. And uh, called uh, Wiagama Lake or Round Lake, uh, you know they they're celebrating their uh, fourth intake of uh, of the Suboxone treatment program, which they started uh, this spring. So things are happening. Uh, you know, we're, we're, I don't think we're saying that we're feeling totally helpless, but it's just uh, the the government also needs to to do their part to support our communities. And just. Yeah. Um, you know, you brought up the enforcement side, and I've interviewed the RCMP before, before on this, and they've said that cracking down on this particular issue, is, uh, this particular issue, and I guess the smuggling of these pills into First Nations communities. You talked about the fact that there aren't ph pharmacies in the communities, and these pills have to be coming from somewhere. And they said, from the enforcement side of things, it's really, really difficult for them because there's such a rampant black market and these pills are being sewn into things like diapers or being put into things uh, like cereal boxes and that's how they get into the community in the first place. So I guess the issue is how do you or is there a way to, to cut off that supply and is there a way to try and, I don't know, in terms of dealing with uh, addiction on the reserve, should they, in terms of the resources, there sh should there be uh, more help for, um, I guess, treating treating the addictions uh, and, and symptoms of withdrawal? Well, obviously, one, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned, that the, the cooperation that's happening with the police forces uh, is uh, commended. You know, I mean, they're under-resourced. Uh, they're always uh, asking, uh, all forces are asking for um, 
uh, more resourcing to, to deal with that. And, uh, and yes, uh, there, there is a problem with uh, carriers and that, but unfortunately a lot of these people are not, uh, they're not the ones buying, buying the stuff, you know. Uh, I've seen where um, elders have been asked to uh, carry a, a package into the community, uh, you know, with stuff that's uh, taped or glued into a cardboard box or a hockey stick or whatever. They end up getting in trouble, but they're not, uh, they're basically asked, could you deliver this to such and such, you know, and uh, so there's a lot of stuff like that. I mean, never, you're never quite catching the, the guy that supplies, buys and supplies the uh, the drugs, you know. You you catch the people that carry it, and unfortunately, they're, they're in, in most cases, they're just the innocent uh, people. They they don't know what uh, what's in the package, you know. So, um yeah, we have to tackle it. Uh, there's some education piece that uh, we would like to do as raising awareness about that, uh, not only the rights of individuals, uh, but things like that. We've uh, talked to air airlines as well for greater cooperation. And uh, But um, what trumps all, all of this stuff is because of our um, overarching uh, charter rights and freedoms, you know, that we cannot uh, infringe on anybody's right, you know, um, and so, uh, so really, that uh, unless you have a red flag, the the police are not searching the bags and that. So some First Nations in that aspect have took it upon themselves, uh, declaring their own jurisdiction in the community, that uh, appointed uh, peace officers or uh, band constables, and they they will search while the OPP or the NAPS officer watches in case there's any uh, violence uh, takes place. Um, uh, and the chiefs have taken upon themselves to take matters into their hands, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that uh, in the community. I, I'd like to add something to the enforcement issue. In British Columbia, we had something called the Vancouver Agreement, which was dealing with with abuse of, of drugs and, and opiates especially. Uh, but, of course, heroin is, and not OxyContin is what is being used in a port city like Vancouver. Um, but but there, it's a, there's a, a clear public health strategy that one can use. The first one, as the chief just said, is education and awareness. So people understand that there is an abuse of this drug, that this drug is highly addictive. The second piece is something called harm reduction. And, and, and the idea of harm reduction as a prevention method is a really important one. So there's prevention and harm reduction. And then there is treatment and rehabilitation. And then, of course, enforcement is one of the ways that we look at it. But when you look at how North America is where this is a major problem, in the United States and Canada, but when you go to Europe and you go to Australia, you see that they are actually taking extraordinary steps using that clear four-pillar approach, which is where many people from British Columbia, and I did, and, and the mayor did, saw that this, in fact, was working in Europe. And so we need to look at what is a best practice. We need to look at what evidence tells us works, and we need to start moving towards it. But it's a very complex issue. We started, uh, I was a minister in charge of the Vancouver Agreement when uh, under Mr. Kretchen, and we started to a look at research into new ways of dealing with addiction and one of the things was opiates and opioids and we created there was something down at UBC um, a research project with UBC I think University of Toronto um, University of Montreal and there they were looking at something called the Naomi project which was a way that we were trying to replicate what Europe was doing with opiate abuse and opioid abuse um, it was it was done this government came in it's sitting under somebody's desk under their chair it's been thrown into the garbage. I don't know. But it, in fact, tells us that it's a, there's an evidence-based approach. We should look at what Europe is doing. But there is a lack of political will, and there's a morality to substance abuse that people haul out every time we look at this, which is a massive a problem that creates high levels of mortality, of morbidity, and of social d d harm, that we really need to get, get, get at this, and there needs to be a strong political will to do it. Peter, uh, Peter Mezzer, Lobby Monitor. Just a question for Chief Desno. You mentioned um, writing letters and, and so on. Can I just get you to, to give some detail on the different uh, efforts and attempts you've made over the years to get in touch with the minister on this particular issue and any communications you've had with government? Uh, maybe I'll refer this to the, uh, the letters. <coughs> well, as I mentioned, 
earlier that uh, we just came on the non-executive end of uh, August of this year. But uh, from the previous executive, uh, we were informed that uh, since they declared uh, a state of emergency back in 2009, uh, they've been writing letters. There's a number of resolutions that our chiefs have passed at their assembly, at, uh, at the regional assembly. Uh, there's going to be a resolution passed uh, at the National Assembly here uh, tomorrow uh, calling on the government to take action and calling on the minister to uh, to meet with the leadership uh, to see firsthand the the impacts of this epidemic and so far there's been no no response so there's been resolutions passed there's been letters written uh, to the minister and uh, so far there's been no response and those are by the individual communities uh, both uh, by individual communities, uh, by the non executive, by the regional leadership, and by the national leadership. So it's uh, it's an all out effort on our part to uh, at least try to get a message across to the minister. And do you have any future plans for, for trying to get that across if uh, the government doesn't respond to your request today? Well, that's something we'll have to uh, uh, discuss, I think, at our assembly uh, tomorrow when we introduce this resolution to the PIL leadership and see. Uh, how else we can uh, try to move it forward. All right, that's the end of my list. Anyone else? Okay, Christy? Just a quick follow-up. Um, there have been people in the Conservative Party um, that have suggested uh, that one of the reasons why the government gave the green light to these uh, generic forms of oxy or because they were afraid of being sued by those companies that wanted to get the drugs on the market. And the government has suggested that on the record that they don't have the legal capacity uh, to prevent the drugs from getting to market. Do you, do you think, do you, would you say that is untrue? Or do they need to change the, the legislation to, to make it so that those drugs can't get on the market? I would like to respond to that. A, currently the government has the power, and I'm going to read for you. The Food and Drug Regulation, Section C-01-014, requires a manufacturer to obtain a drug identification number, D-I-N, before the sale of a product. And what this section provides, uh, the, part, the, part, the second part of the, the section provides, and, the, and I'm reading it, where the director believes on reasonable grounds that a product in respect of which an application was referred to because it to go on to the market um, would cause injury to the health of the consumer or purchaser, then he may refuse to issue the document referred to. So the minister currently has the ability under the regulations, which I just read to you, to stop. She, she may, in fact, arguably be sued if she tries to stop private companies from actually producing a drug. But she has the power to stop that drug from getting to the market. That is what we're saying she should be utilizing right now. Then look when she calls together this panel of, of the various people we talked about and look at ways in which she might actually bring to, the, to Parliament an ability to amend the actual legislation itself. But currently, she does have an ability to stop these drugs, once they're produced, from getting onto the market. And the minister knows this, and she has refused to do anything about it. And we're pointing this out to her and say, buy yourself some time, get together the group, get a comprehensive action plan going, look at this as a public health problem, and deal with it accordingly under the, the four areas I talked to you about. Um, it's as uh, simple it, as that. It, it, this is a public health emergency, and I think we're pretty disappointed that the minister and her staff all met with a number of these companies in the spring, but refuses to meet um, with First Nations um, leaders. I, I, so far, she seems to only have one side of the story, and and she has got to deal with this. And and I, I guess we can't finish this conference without saying that a lot of this is also the legacy of residential schools, that, that with that lovely stained glass window there, that I hope every time the minister walks under that light that shines from that window, that she understands that having cancelled the, the Healing Foundation and that she has got to move 
on this issue as, as a responsibility of this government if you are actually going to take the responsibility of the legacy and the intergenerational trauma of residential schools properly. That there isn't an addiction facility in this country that won't tell you about the, 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 the incidents of previous child abuse or, or previous sexual abuse in their clientele. This is a, this is a serious issue and uh, uh, this government has a responsibility to do all things, including not having to have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission go to court to get the, the documents as we found out this week. That we also believe that, um, that, you know, at this time, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission needs the time and the money to finish its job properly. But part of, of, a, uh, of the Prime Minister's apology, where he said he would look, look forward with a new path together, that, that dealing with this issue of, of addiction, dealing with the issue of Aboriginal justice, dealing with so many of these things where the government is just going in the wrong direction and not providing these, these leaders uh, with the resources they need to, to, to keep their communities well. I think that Carolyn was very passionate about that. Just as much we should know that OxyContin is a street drug of choice in, in many of the provinces, and that is why the provincial ministers asked the minister to assist them in delaying the, mark, the, the marketability of generic OxyContin. Because this is in, in the maritime provinces, the Atlantic provinces, in the prairies. I mean, the only place that it's not the massive drug, street drug of addiction is in British Columbia, where actual heroin is the drug. So I think this is something that affects everyone, all Canadians. And the thing about an addiction is that it can happen to anyone. Uh, nobody is immune, and this is a huge, as Carolyn said, public health crisis out there. And this minister has to, and this government has to, put aside its animosity and its whatever its moral judgment is on people who use drugs or who, or, or who, who are addicts, and look at them as people who need to have an ability to get the help that they need. And one way to do it, we're just saying right now, is to actually stop generic Oxycontin from getting onto the market. Any last words, Chief? Yes. Um, again, uh, I just want to say this is a matter of uh, life and death, and it's, uh, like I said, it's also personal. And when I say about holistic approach, our remote First Nations uh, sit on probably one of the most uh, untapped uh, natural resources, uh, at least in Northern Ontario. And um, this is going to have an impact on our decision making. Um, and, uh, and we're saying that if uh, this issue is not dealt with, you know, uh, it will impact a lot of decisions. So, um, uh, and that's, that's just uh, one of them uh, of many. I think uh, governments have called on saying the ring of fire is, uh, is a equal to the tar sands and so on, well, guess what? Um, it's not going to happen unless uh, First Nations feel their, their issues are being addressed. And this is one of the, the most pressing issues right now, and uh, along with, uh, with others. So uh, that's what I mean about uh, that. Uh, it will impact a lot of lives. It will impact the finances of government uh, more ways than one. Governments, plural, more ways than one. So. I think we have one more for, uh, from Peter. One last quick question for Ms. Bai. Uh, I think the minister, in her argument uh, for not inter intervening on this, was uh, she said she didn't want to set a precedent for politicizing uh, the decision or, or the approval of medicine. So, so what's your response to that? Well, this is not about politics. This is about evidence. The evidence is very clear. The generic oxycodone is being abused it is being used on the streets, it's wrecking lives, it's creating high levels of mortality and morbidity, which is why the provincial health ministers asked her to help them to do something about it. This is a, a medical problem, this is a public health problem, it is a crisis in this country and in the United States. In Europe they have dealt with it. This minister is not politicizing, she's doing her job as a minister, that is her role. She loves to talk about caring for the health and safety of Canadians. This is about the health and safety of Canadians. It's not about politics, not doing anything.
is about playing politics. Merci à vous quatre. Thank you so much, folks.